Hi, you're watching Monday Night Live. My name is Brendan Malone, and in this episode, I'm going to be speaking to Dr. John Fox. John has a PhD in English Literature from the University of Auckland. He has been an academic. He's worked in the area of family and community restoration, as well as public policy, and also with children and young people. John is an Anglican curate, and he is also a board member on the Elevate Christian Disability Trust here in New Zealand. Without any further ado, let's have this important conversation with John about the issue of euthanasia and the disability community. John, thank you so much for being on tonight to have this important conversation about the End of Life Choice Act, euthanasia, and in particular, the issues around disability and the disability community, and, and I guess their interaction with this issue. Can you start by telling us just a little bit about your own experience with disability so people can get a, a sense for the connectedness that you have with this issue? It's lovely to be here, uh, although... Uh... The subject is one which massively depresses people. It's also really vital that people get to grips with the issue. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm really grateful that that you are lending your channel and your voice to to that cause. Um, I should say I am a disabled person. I have spastic hemiplegia, which is the uh, the stable form of cerebral palsy. I don't have a speech impediment, but I've got various mobility issues. Uh, and the right side of my body is weaker than the left. I was uh, born at 30 weeks, 10 weeks premature, stuck in an incubator. Um, and then as my skeleton grew, I had to endure several episodes of mobility decline. Yeah. Um, and also chronic pain. So that's that's one hat I, I wear. I'm also a priest, although I'm in Mufti today. Uh, I've been a hospital chaplain. Um, I spend lots of time with the vulnerable elderly. And also, I'm a trustee of Elevate, which is the Christian Disability Trust. So um, Elevate has been going for about 40 years now, and we have five or six um, sort of ministry networks around the country. There are 21 national branches. And we look after the physically disabled people like me, uh, who are mildly disabled, all the way through to motor neuron disease and the, the really tough stuff, the stuff that ends up on TV, um, and, and the terminally ill. And then we have uh, a, a group for the blind, um, one for the intellectually disabled, and one for the families of disabled children. So basically our job is to build relational connectedness um, and to give as much support and advocacy as we can and spiritual care to disabled people uh, in our network and to give them some of the things that able-bodied people take for granted. Somebody to watch a movie with, somebody to worship with, uh, somebody to listen to how you're doing. But I am insanely proud of our record of genuinely helping people to reconnect with society and genuinely uh, defending the, the dignity of every life. So those are the three hats that I, I wear. Yeah. I care about this because I'm a disabled person. Uh, also, I've been reasonably close to, to death and impairment. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at um, you know, the 5,800 people that get our newsletter and, and thinking of them as well. You, you've, you've actually got, uh, so you've got skin in the game, as they say. Um, and, and you're also connected to to people who are a part of that disability community. It's not just about your lived experience, as they say. It's about those others you're connected with as well. Why do the issues of euthanasia and assisted suicide, why is it that, that for the disability community, they have such concern, they are so invested in, the, in these issues? In some ways, it seems probably other than terminal people, they would be the other group that, to me, straight away seem to be very invested in these issues. Why is that? Well, for a start, um, I, I think 
the the principle of euthanasia is one that disabled people feel quite deeply. Um, I I know that the disability sector isn't monolithic. My my own estimate would be, it's eighty twenty opposed. Yeah. Uh, but in any community, that's a that that's a, an impressive ratio. Yeah, there will always yeah. be the people who say, "My life, my choice, and demand it." But in large part, the the disability community is opposed to the bill or wary of it because. Um, for, for a start, we, we know what suicidality looks like. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the risk factors for suicide, disability and pain are two of them. Yeah. Um, so it's really common for disabled people, um, especially people who become disabled, but also people like me who have to grow up with a, a condition that's incurable and painful, um, to have extremes of emotion, to have difficulty adjusting to have grief that needs to be dealt with um to have episodes in which we don't feel the value of our lives yeah um in a way that able-bodied people uh don't uh haven't haven't experienced to the same depth yeah so it's quite us usual for me in my pastoral work to hear uh, either from the disabled or the disabled elderly, um, and that's you know 57% of the very elderly they also qualify as disabled. Look, look, my life isn't worth living. I'm in terrible pain. Yeah. This is awful. I don't like it. Um, I wish, I wish it would all stop. Yeah. Um, so I think because I know what that feels like, and because I've I've walked with a number of people who've been through that space um I, i'm really wary of a a position on disabled suicide that says um you know if, if i would if i were dan carter if i were a 25 year old rugby player um and i went to the gp and said i want to die they'd push the red button there'd be suicide prevention yeah. there'd be hotlines there'd be counseling they would they would do the holistic analysis that begins why don't why do you want to die uh, what are your meds like who is there that lives in your house what support do you have and they would bend over backwards there would be nobody who says for an able-bodied person uh, authorizing your suicide is a good thing yeah um suddenly when it's a, when it's a disabled person when it's somebody in pain when it's somebody who's terminally ill um when it's somebody who's old it becomes thinkable for us to do this. So just before we get to the structure of the actual bill and why I don't like those things, just in principle, yep. my position is that what we're doing is carving out a group of people whose lives matter less yep. on the grounds that they're disabled, that they're sick, then they're term that they are terminally ill. Um, and we're doing that in a way that we would never do for able-bodied people or for people who weren't terminally ill. A lot of people, when they think about this this issue, they think, well, it's just about people who qualify and who make a request, and it'll only be about, about them. But really, the key point that you're making there, right, is that, no, the whole of society will now have effectively a type of class structure, if you like, where you fit into a particular category and we say it's okay for you to end your life because we don't think you're living a life that's really worthy of much if you want to end it. And other people we say, no, you're too valuable. We won't let you do that. Yeah, I mean, I don't say that people intend that, but I no. think that will be the, the, the practical effect. Um, the other thing I would say is that my experience of pain, uh, and this is also good uh, pain clinic and palliative care practice as well, is that... Um, the request that says I, I want to die always comes in a context. Yeah. Um, so there was a particular old lady that was associated with Elevate. She wrote a submission to the Justice Committee about euthanasia. Uh, I won't name her name, but she's Googleable if, uh, if, if people want, because all the submissions are public. Um, she said, I'm old. Uh, in my care home, uh, it's expensive. All my friends are dead. I had a fight with my daughter. I've got a declining condition. I can't do the things that I used to do. Um, I can't go outside and do the, do the garden. She had a number of other things that she liked to do. Um, I'm, I'm in pain. 
I don't like the staff in my care home. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, at the end of that big list of about 15 things, she said, I, I want to die and I demand that right. Yeah. Um, and then and then she did. She killed herself. Yeah. And I, I sit there and think, OK, so I the request to die comes at the end of a whole bunch of other things. And that's my experience of disabled suicidality as well. Yeah. When, when you say, as I've said, oh, God, make it stop. Yeah, that's the beginning of a conversation which be, which begins. Are there times when it's less bad? Are there things you still enjoy doing? What is particularly bad about today? What meds are you on? Uh, who is there that lives in your house that can give you some support? Where do you find meaning in your life? Yeah. And it, it's it's part of my job, and and actually all three contexts, um, to listen to what people are saying and to help them uh, lean into the good things about their life, um, lean into the reasons why they want to stay around and try and move some of the things which are on top of them. And that is what we would do for anyone else yeah. who was having episodes of suicidality. It's what good suicide prevention does. Yeah. So uh, my first reason for disliking the bill is that it institutionalizes a sort of second class status for disabled life. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the second reason is um, medical trust. Yeah. So one of the things that able-bodied people really don't understand very well is how hugely vulnerable disabled people are to the medical system. Yes. Um, so I am 37, I'm white, I'm pretty articulate. I don't have a communication difficulty. I've got four degrees, including a PhD. I'm a priest. Um, I'm quite bolshy yeah. um, by temperament. I can. I have a Dutch mother, and I can spell ombudsman, and I can <laughs> complain quite loudly. Yeah. Um, in, in my community, I'm kind of a, a best-case scenario in terms of the, the things that would make you confident and, and things that would make you feel safe. Um, and my experience of the medical system is that I still feel and experience profound vulnerability every time I lie on an x-ray table and I'm in a hospital gown and, you, you know, I'm, I'm BDW596 as opposed to Do the Reverend Dr. John Fox. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, you know, the trainee x-ray technician has put me on my bad hip and I'm shouting at her, please, can you... Can you move me? And she can't hear me. Yeah. I mean, that, that doesn't say the medical system is full of bad people. But, you know, there are some wonderful people. The system is doing what it can to help me. I understand that. But the only thing that allows that degree of vulnerability to be okay, the only thing that allows us to entrust the vulnerable elderly or the people with dementia or the dis disabled with communication difficulties to the medical system is the confidence that I first do no harm. The doctor isn't going to hurt me. Yeah. Um, the doctor is trustworthy. Um, the doctor will make sure that my life is protected. Yeah. And I think that is profoundly precious, not only to doctors and to palliative care specialists and to the medical association who are, are urging people to vote no for that reason. Um, but it's also profoundly precious to the people it protects. Yes. So when when you have uh, what is essentially a suicide bill that is being staffed by doctors, um, that I think atta att attracts medical trust. Attacks medical trust. I want to talk about the uh, some of the specifics of the bill. You, you've briefly said you know you'd like to get into that, so I want to talk about that soon. But before we get to there. Tell me, you're someone who has been actively involved um, in speaking to politicians and really, you know, you had an intimate engagement with the political process that led to the final act that everyone is now going yeah. to vote on in the referendum. How do you feel about that process? How do you feel about the political process that led to this outcome now? I I think it was a shambles, yeah. uh, to be really honest. Um, I, I saw maybe... 40 MPs by myself over about three or four years 
Um, so I talked to many of the people who were making this decision. Um, the first thing I would like, I, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to say thank you to the people who actually met me, yeah. because there were a substantial minority of MPs who didn't meet anybody on either side of the issue. Yeah, so actually, in in terms of, we would we would say, please, can we meet you? And they would either not reply, or or, or you would get. Well, so maybe. What do you want to talk about? I'd say assisted dying, and they'd say no. We're not taking in meetings on that. Wow. So um, there were a number of of MPs, and I don't know how they made the decision they made mm, because yeah. they didn't talk to anybody. Um, not only from Team No, but on any side of the issue. Yeah. Um, the second thing I would say is that there's a, a huge. De- degree of fear and ignorance about disability. So this was one of the things that I found profoundly hurtful, um, listening to first reading speeches from people who shall remain nameless, saying, um, I'm frightened of wiping, I'm frightened of drooling, I'm frightened of defecating, I'm frightened of dependency. And I'm sitting there listening to it in a room full of people in wheelchairs with catheters yeah. Uh, and IVs and various other forms of dependency. Yeah. And essentially what I heard when they said, I don't want a life which is dependent, is I don't want your life. I'd rather be dead than be you. Uh, you know, I've had two periods of decline which were full of profound grief, which still jumps at me sometimes. I've had to learn how to be dependent. I've had to learn how to accept help. I've had to learn not to be autonomous. And for people running around going, well, the biggest value in life is autonomy. The thing I value the most isn't your life or your dignity or or your safety. Uh, The thing I value most is is the comfort of the autonomous individual. Yeah. I found that really hard. It's it's interesting, Um, isn't it? Because it seems to me that... there's a huge contradiction here, and I want to get your thoughts on this because it seems that that is a, a glaring contradiction and a, and a grave hypocrisy too, in the sense that a lot of the people who would enunciate that view you've just described are a lot of the same people who would, uh, and say in other areas of politics, say, no, we must be concerned about the vulnerable and how our laws and policies affect yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, they're very focused on identity politics and trying to understand people's various lived experiences. And even now, with you know the talk of privilege or perhaps the whole response to COVID, it's, it's, it's all, it seems they're all the polar opposite, but on this issue, that they, they, that they adopted a harsh autonomy. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I was profoundly disappointed to see people who would, in any other context, say, we have to remember our connectedness. You know, there are reasons why people are stuck. We we have to help them out. And, and all of that stuff, uh, that sort of social justice rhetoric that I, I too believe in, um, suddenly went out the window. Um, and I said, you know, to one particular very left-wing MP, look, look please uh, pick solidarity. Don't, don't pick this... this um, this notion that that people make decisions by themselves. Of course they don't. Decisions come in a context. Um, Decisions are connected, uh, incarnated in people and connected to one another. I want to hear you say your suicide would leave us all poorer. Yeah. Um, And there seemed to be a pronounced unwillingness to say that. And then once once we had explained exactly how complicated the bill was and exactly how impractical it would be to work it, there also seemed to be a genuine unwillingness to go further than that. Yes. So people said, well, yes, that's difficult. Well, yes, clearly the bill is is um, flawed. And, and, you know, no one, not even David Seymour, said to me the bill was perfect. Um, yeah. they, they were all trying to fix it. They were all trying to band-aid it. And I kept saying, look, you're band-aiding the wrong things. Um, the whole approach here is wrong. Yeah. But it seemed for so many people to come down either to political p- calculation or to personal experience. So people said things like, well, my grandfather died. And the notion of disability that they had also seemed to be sort of stuck in the 70s. Um, you know, you had these these awful mental pictures that some of the MPs seemed to have uh, of, of 
you know, polio victims lie, lying in concrete rooms. Yeah. And I kept trying to say, well, no, that isn't what modern disability looks like. Even if you are in pain, even if you do have a terminal illness, palliative care and social care has advanced so much in the 30 years since you saw that person or you had that experience. Um, but because there is a large degree of ignorance about death and what normal death looks like, and a large degree of ignorance about disability and what disabled life looks like. Um, it was easy for people to get away with that. And then when I tried to budge them, they would say, oh, the meeting is over now. See, see I, I can I can understand how you get people who are ignorant and, and they have that ignorance you've talked about, not being aware of what uh, it is to be part of the disability community and to, to live that experience today compared to, say, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. However, what I don't understand is that at that point when you you're someone there who's able to actually explain and to say well here's the truth there's an unwillingness to listen and th so there's look oh yeah the bill is imperfect but <laughs> uh wh why yeah. wh why do you think that is what what is it it does this speak to perhaps a deeper issue in society around what some would call ableism you know the idea that people do, just don't they're not even connecting or not willing to actually connect with that experience of people who are who are in the disability community I, I think there are a number of things going on there. Um, what, one is, I mean, it, you're right that even when we had an event at Parliament and we had disability experts and palliative care professors and the medical association and, and the best minds that we could on our side of the argument, and we said literally to people, please come downstairs and hear it. Mm. Hear the arguments. You say you want this debate. Fine, let's have it. Literally about 20 people came. Yeah. Um, yeah. The vast majority of people didn't come. So I think that unwillingness is right. Um, I, I think it's partly it, it's partly that uh, the issue is complicated and demanding. Um, yeah. And there was a certain reluctance to be asked to make this decision, which is why we're having a referendum now. Yeah. Um, there was a certain resentment of those of us who were trying to make the issue more complicated, in quote marks, yeah. um, because of our actual experiences and um, the arguments that we were asking people to consider. It was politically easier to get in a room, reduce it to the lowest common denominator, band-aid the terminal illness clause, yeah. try and fix the worst bits. And then shove the compromise through and get it off de off desks, and I think that is partly because the disability community isn't particularly politically organised. Yeah. Um, I mean, Elevate has no advocacy budget. I got a I got a Jetstar ticket up from Christchurch. Uh, you know, I put on my suit, my clerical collar, and I did the best that I could. But I couldn't say, well. Uh, lot, lots of politically aware, articulate disabled people are going to hate you and vote against you at the next yeah. election. Yeah. And I got the, I got the impression that had I been representing trade unions or, or welfare beneficiaries or business groups or or farmers or whatever, people would have listened to me at a much greater level. I mean, there was an MP who literally began our conversation by asking, "How much money does Elevate have?" Wow. Wow. And I thought, well, okay, one, um, that's irrelevant. So um, why are you asking me that? And she she said that it was about funding sources for me or something. Yeah. Um, but my impression was there were a number of MPs who wanted to know how much trouble I was prepared to be. Yes. Yeah, that's shocking. Uh, and I... I find that genuinely insulting yeah. because I can understand wanting to have the debate and demanding to have the debate, which everybody said up to the second reading, but then they didn't come to hear the debate. They weren't in the house hearing the debate. They didn't consider all of the amendments that we put up, and they mm. would, there were none of them that were frivolous. We wanted to highlight the things in the bill that we didn't like and the things in the bill that we thought wouldn't work. And we wanted to engage constructively with the committee and with the parliamentary process. And I genuinely thought there would be more MPs that were willing to do that for and, and with us. 
um, I would like to thank the minority across the political spectrum who genuinely heard me out and tried to engage with what I said. Yeah. I deeply appreciate that, um, especially after they figured out that Elevator is a volunteer organization that, that doesn't have the advocacy budget of the Salvation Army or the Presbyterian support. Yeah. Um, I, I deeply appreciate people who, who who wanted to hear our perspective and, and our experiences. It, it was a great grief to me that at the third reading of the bill, for example, the Minister of Disability Issues was sitting in the front row opposite me in the gallery and sniggering at the things that uh, the, the MPs on our side were saying. Yeah dismissing the dis stories of disabled people. Um, there were a number of MPs who I think should have known better and should have done better. Yeah. Um, we did enough work, um, and a number of people did uh, enough work, for us as a country now to have this debate. Um, I don't want a replay of the, the parliamentary, yeah. the parliamentary debate mostly because we didn't really have one. Uh, and I, 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 I would appeal to everybody, please, please, please read the bill. Take the issue seriously. Decide for yourself whether you think it will work. Uh, but be knowledgeable before you vote. Tell me, um, those who are proponents of this bill and the architects of the bill, uh, inside and outside of Parliament, one thing that you hear a lot now is they say, look, the disability clause, quote unquote, uh, has been removed from the bill. That remained in the bill to almost the very end, though, right? And for a long time, we were told this bill was safe. It was the safest it could be. That clause remained in the bill the whole time. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute, it comes out. And then we're told, oh, we've made it even safer now. Does that concern you, the fact that there was such a gung-ho approach to that clause and effectively, it seems that people were lying when they said it was as safe as it could be. Uh, I think they were clearly lying. Um, mm. Yes, obviously, they didn't want to take out the, the clause for incurable disability. Um, but the, th the thing that also worries me is that even when you limit it to terminal illness, they've left in, in the next clause of the bill, more or less a description of incurable disability. So they've said things like, um, well, age... You can't just authorize someone's suicide because of their age. Yeah. But the key there is just their age is still relevant. I can't be authorized for suicide just because I'm disabled, but the fact that I'm disabled is relevant. Yeah. Um, and and the idea of incurable conditions and declining conditions is preserved in the bill, um, and and the experience in other countries is one that. The meaning of terminal illness uh, tends to expand. So you think, you know, terminal illness defined as will kill you in six months is fairly clear. Yeah. Uh, but overseas experience is, I mean, A, we're really bad at predicting when people will die. You and I both know people who are on team no who've been told that they would die seven, eight, 10, 14 years ago, and they're still here. Um, so we're not as good as at predicting things uh, as we like to pretend. But also, um, in places like Oregon, uh, terminal illness is, you know, without treatment will kill you in six months. Yeah. So you can have something like diabetes, stop taking your insulin, and that's a terminal illness because you'll be dead in six months. So um, with all of the eligibility things, um, disability, age, declining condition, terminal illness, you've more or less got to think like a $10 lawyer. Yeah. Uh, not just what do I think this means on its surface, but what could it be made to mean? What, what does it allow to happen? Yeah. And my worry is, and this is you know, a, a widespread worry in the disability sector too, that simply describing somebody who's disabled isn't a great uh, a, a great deal of protection. I mean, yes, they've taken out Clause 4 explicitly. We worked very hard to get them to do that. Yeah. Um, but the the ableist attitudes are still there. Uh, p 
people see it at the third reading. Don't worry if you have an incurable condition, we hear you. Yeah. Uh, the experience in other countries is that once you've created a category, um, the category then inevitably expands. Yeah. So you have uh, very little reason after you've granted the principle of euthanasia to say, well, w what about mature teenagers if they're 16 and not 18? Um, what, what about people? I mean, we're already in the bill where we're allowing people with communications difficulties to be signed for by their families. Yeah. Um, what, what about ch children and newborns as, as in the Netherlands uh, and their parents want them to be euthanized? Um, what about prisoners? What about, uh, as in the Netherlands now, the new bill on, in the parliament is everybody over the age of 75? Yeah. Um, and even in Oregon, where they started by being careful and moderate, uh, you can see the, the graph only goes one direction and it's up. Yeah. So once we have this, there's no logical stopping point between uh, we're going to kill somebody, we're going to authorize the suicide of some people. You've now sold the path for a number of vulnerable groups, a number of vulnerable demographics. And there's no logical way of stopping that. And that that makes me profoundly uneasy yeah. because I know how difficult it is to live disabled life and to do disabled death in the system the way that it is already. And for every added risk factor, for every added thing we put on top of the disabled and the vulnerable, it will get harder and harder and harder to insist, no, I see value in my life. I want to live. Now, obviously, John, you're not simply a one-dimensional person. You have this other aspect of your life. You're an Anglican curate. You visit the sick and the dying. You provide pastoral care and uh, support to them in those times of great crisis. So are there other aspects of this bill beyond just the questions that might affect the disability community in particular that, that uh, motivate you to be on Team No, as you describe it? Yes, there are lots. Uh, I, I think um, it's really common for the elderly, especially if they are in care homes or, or if their life has in some ways been fractured, like a, a spouse dies or, or, or something like this, um, to have a period of reevaluating the value of their lives, um, a period of emotional difficulty and bereavement and, and grief. That, that's quite common. Um, and because any number of the elderly people I'm thinking of are stoic and they don't want to be trouble, they don't want to be a burden to their families, um, they, they don't want to ask for things even when they really need them. Yeah. Um, the other thing that concerns me is the risk not only of coercion but, but, but of... Uh, uh, what some have called a throwaway culture, yeah. which is, um, you know, we have a culture which increasingly close close for difficult conversations for long-term accompaniment of people who might not at that moment feel their value, um, for genuine care and solidarity with not only the disabled but the elderly um, and the depressed and the people in difficulty. Um, at the moment, the medical system tries to enable those conversations, tries to enable the suicide prevention, uh, tries to enable us to put our arms around people who are in difficulty and say, well, we'll carry you, we'll support you, we will hold your dignity for you until you feel like it's worth getting up in the morning. Yeah. Um, and my worry with a, a bill which would allow a doctor who's never met you before to authorize your suicide in, in three or four days, um, is that that's basically the end of a conversation and not the beginning of one. Yeah. Um, so you don't you don't do the the long term support for people who are fractured and bereaved and, and maybe depressed and, and in difficulty. Um, you don't have a proper psych exam, except if the doctors disagree. You have a competence exam, but that's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, you don't have proper suicide prevention. Um, 
And once you layer on all of these things, you've got people who are vulnerable who need their communities to support them at the end of life. Um, and at a moment when they are in difficulty and in pain, um, even if it's only existential pain, why am I here? I used to have a life and now I don't. Um, I used to know where I fit and now I don't. Yeah. Uh, I used to have people who love me and now they're all dead. That That's when the, the wider community, I would argue, has a genuine duty to say, well, we love you. Uh, we know you're not done yet. Um, no, there is still good in in your life. Um, we see it, even even if you don't. Um, and, and and if somebody thinks that that is bigoted, imperialist, and religious, you know, I'm running around telling people they have value in their lives. That's what you would do for the 25 year old rugby player, yeah. or or the 15 year old who uh, broke up with his girlfriend, or the person with mental illness. Uh, we do it in every other context. We, we say it's okay to ask for help. We ask, are you okay? Um, I, I want genuine, really good, really joined up, modern and uh, awake social care and palliative care and pain services for every person who needs them. Yeah. Um, and my experience is that quite a few people, including for eight months, me um, did, had to sit on waiting lists, had to advocate for themselves, didn't get the care they wanted, uh, n needed, uh, or were entitled to. And then suddenly we go, well, hang on, um, you know, this person who we've left in, in pain or in difficulty or on a waiting list for palliative care because they live in Taranaki or because. Um, we have limited resources. Uh, they, these are the people who I think drive the emotional case for euthanasia. I entirely understand if you can't get out of a situation that you feel like you're trapped in, um, that, that, that causes you to discount your life. The bit I'm opposed to is where society agrees with you. Tell me, the issue of eugenics is something that uh, we, you'd call it a long and troubled perhaps history, uh, particularly in the West. Now, do you think that's a factor here? Because the, the supporters of this bill would say, don't be silly, that's just scaremongering. Uh, you know, this has nothing to do with eugenics or any of those eugenic type programs like the, the euthanasia issue that the Nazis ran. Now, obviously, I want to be clear here, what we're not, I'm not suggesting that people who support this bill are Nazis. That's, you know, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. But that history, that dark history of eugenics, do you see the disconnect here? Are these two separate things or do you still think that there are connections here that are things that we should consider? I don't think the vast majority of people who support the bill understand uh how they sound to those of us in vulnerable categories. Uh, I I genuinely think that most people who will vote yes are doing it because they want to relieve pain, because they have heard the tragic stories, because they want to reach out to people and, and do something to help them. Um, but the practical effect, not the intention, but the practical effect of saying... Uh, we will protect the lives of everybody but the disabled and the terminally ill, um, is that you will see fewer disabled people. You will yeah. see fewer terminally ill people. Eventually, you will see fewer elderly people because people will have, in quote marks, exercised their choices. Yeah. Um, and, and that does have an effect on the kind of society that we turn into. So um, I often say something like... Um, D disabled people are really great on the Weepix packet, you know, when we're running the triathlon or, or, or doing the Paralympics or whatever. And everybody goes, yeah, no, great. We're in favor of an inclusive society. That's what we want. We want disabled people to have equal life and to feel that they're valued and necessary and equal with everybody else. And then you get to the part where you might have to have a special needs child, where you might need to support somebody who's ill when you might need to accompany somebody to dying under difficult circumstances, 
uh, where you might have to hold someone's dignity for them yeah. and care for them. And that is incredibly hard. Yeah. Uh, and the system, the way that it isn't con constructed, makes that harder. So uh, in large part, we don't value social care and we don't value carers. So what we end up doing then is putting people who are like GPs, who might only have one or two days of training in palliative care and very little expertise in severe disability, and to a situation where they're looking at somebody who is genuinely hurting, yeah. genuinely hurt, and they want to help. And what we've got to give as a society is a, a syringe for love, nebutel, or, or whatever. Yeah. I, I find that bit, that last bit, is the bit that appalls me. Yeah. Um, that, that essentially the best we can do for people who are terminally ill and disabled it, it is the medical equivalent of, of sod off, sorry you were here. I, I find that appalling. On that particularly sombre note, John, obviously this is an extremely serious issue, an extremely serious referendum. Just to finish with, what would you say to people who perhaps are undecided, they're not sure how to vote in the upcoming referendum, what would your words to those people be? First of all, I'd say on the ballot isn't I support euthanasia, yes or no. It's I support the end of life choice bill. So there are people like me who would always vote against a euthanasia bill. There are people who will always vote for one. But I think the vast majority of the country wants to be assured that if we have a euthanasia bill, that it's safe, that, that it's non-discriminatory, that it won't expose vulnerable people to risk. And to those people, I would say this, please read the bill. Yeah. You're going to be asked, uh, do you want this bill to come into force? It's 10 pages. Please read it. Um, and then ask yourself, think like a lawyer, ask yourself if it's your grandmother or, or, or your disabled son um, or your family member. You know, is it, is it right? Is it decent that they don't even have to tell their family? Is it right, is it decent that a doctor who's never met you before can authorize your suicide? Is it safe to do it in, in as low as three days without anything other than a competence exam? Ask yourself whether what you see in the bill uh, would actually work, will actually work in practice. Yep. Uh, and I think that the vast majority of people who look at this they discriminatory excuse for a law will go oh hang on we don't want that so please read it please think carefully uh, with the vast majority of other policies we can take them back if we get them wrong this one if we get it wrong people genuinely will die and we can't get them back so yes that's heavy Yes, that's probably going to sound extreme, but it's the fact of what euthanasia is that should weigh on every person. And I ask them, not just as a priest, but as a disabled people, person and a, a human being, look into your conscience. Ask yourself what kind of society you want. And, and I think if we do that, there'll be a hang of a lot more people voting no. John, thank you so much for being on the show to talk about this profoundly important issue, for giving of your time, your busy, busy schedule to speak to us. Uh, I found it uh, not just informative, but also, again, really, really challenging whenever I engage with you on these issues. It, it really <laughs> strikes me in the core of my being about ways in which I could be doing and living a more humane response, particularly to those in the disability community. So thank you again for that challenge as well. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the platform, Brandon. God bless you and everyone who'll see this. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side, our fears are done. All the good times just begun. Oh, we know what we have. Let's hold on tight. Found what we're looking for in life. Us crazy, but things are finally right. With you and I, the 
future is bright.